Welcome to Clued in Mystery. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brooke. And we both love mystery. Brooke, today we are talking about something a little different, um, mysteries that aren't murder. Yeah, yeah. We're taking a little departure from the traditional murder mystery. So to get us started, I will read just a little summary of this maybe a sub-sub genre. And, you know, here on the podcast, the stories we discuss usually include a baffling murder. But today we're taking a look at the plots with nary a corpse to be found. Mysteries can be built around any crime, really, such as sabotage, arson, robbery, kidnapping, or blackmail. Sometimes there's a puzzle to be solved or an item to recover, referred to as a MacGuffin in the world of mystery. Maybe there's a hunt for a buried treasure or a hunt for a person selling confidential information. Any and all of these scenarios offer secrets, lies, twists, and turns for a sleuth to unravel. In other words, the making of an intriguing mystery. So if any crime is good fodder for an investigation, why did the genre get so solidly planted in murder? This is likely because physical death is the worst case scenario and creates the highest stakes for the sleuth. What could possibly be worse than a dead body with apparently no explanation? James Scott Bell explains in his book Superstructure that all story is about the risk of death, either literally or figuratively. It may be the death of one's reputation that is at stake, the death of innocence, the death of career and livelihood, or of an important relationship. It's this risk of loss that keeps us turning the page. Some fans of the genre are traditionalists and believe that to be a satisfying mystery, there must be a murder. But I bet we can all think of some favorite titles that aren't strewn with corpses. Cozies and Mysteries Meant for Younger Audiences are a great place to find less violent stories. Gaudy Night by Dorothy L. Sayers is one cozy without murder. In this novel, a mysterious person sets off a series of incidents in a women's college in Oxford in order to create a scandal. Kate Reculia's Tuesday Mooney Talks to Ghosts is a middle grade novel that takes readers on an Edgar, a Edgar Allan Poe inspired scavenger hunt through Boston. But P.I. novels and mystery thrillers can also be based around nonviolent crimes. Think Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Steg Larson, or L is for Lawless by Sue Grafton. And remember, in Poe's early detective story, amateur sleuth Monsieur Dupas was only searching for a missing letter. So Sarah, to begin our conversation, I'm wondering about your opinion. Are nonviolent crimes enough to keep you invested in a mystery? Absolutely. But before I answer your question, let me say, Brooke, that was a really great summary. And um, I've learned a new word, MacGuffin. I don't think I'd come across that before. Um, yeah, so I you know, knew that we were going to be doing this episode and, and uh, initially thought, oh, there's not, you know, I can't think of very many books that I've read that, that don't have a crime or sorry, don't have a murder in them. Um, but uh, after a little bit of, of kind of reflection, I realized that, you know, actually there's a fair number that I've, that I've read. I would, I would say most of the books that I read do have a murder, but uh, there's certainly some, um, some that don't. So I'm currently reading um, Gaudy Night, which you just referred to, and I've read Gone Girl and, and Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Uh, but uh, in the last year, I've read three or four, I think, that um, that you know don't center center around a murder. Um, one of those is uh, the other black girl by uh, Zakia Dalila Harris, and that is really more of a workplace thriller, um, uh, more of a why done it, uh, as well as as well as a who done it, but it's not a murder that she's trying to uh, solve. What about you, Brooke? Same. I actually, when I got to thinking about it, some of my favorite books have been um, based more around some puzzle or um, I love treasure hunt stories. 
So, um, you know, the, the found letter that means something, and then you have to discover what in the world is this referring to? And it sends them off on this mysterious adventure. I love those stories, especially in film. Um, you know, some of my favorite movies, mystery movies have been, um, treasure hunt movies like national treasure. I love that show. Um, even though it's kind of hokey, I love it. Um, I like the mummy, same thing, you know, and, and the mummy to me harkens back to some of the Agatha Christie Egypt mysteries because, you know, the, you know, the curse and those kind of things. So I, I really love that. Um, and then I am a huge Alfred Hitchcock film fan. And I, I go back and forth. So Rear Window, but of course that's a, that includes a murder. Rear Window is one of my faves, but right up there is Vertigo. And um, yeah, so I, I think that there definitely can be enough to keep us just as intrigued and have the stakes be just as high when the story is told in that way to keep us uh, turning the page or or on the edge of our seat, as it were. Yeah, and I, I really like what you what you quoted about all story being uh, at the risk of death, and that death not being a liter necessarily being a literal death, right? Death of reputation or death of relationship, and I think those drive a lot of these stories that that don't have murder as the as the central um, the central theme. You know, there's you know, we, when we talked about domestic thrillers, we talked about secrets. Right, and it's it's preserving, um, mm -hmm. preserving that secret. Uh, so you know, um, some of the other books that I was thinking about, um, particularly around um, reputation. Uh, there's Ace of Spades by uh, Farida Abike Imide, which is you know it's a, a YA mystery set in a high school uh, where there are poison pen notes being circulated by text message. Um, and, you know, trying to figure out who is behind really trying to destroy the reputation of, of the main characters. Um, and uh, there are some other examples in YA. You know, I think of uh, Karen McManus's uh, Two Can Keep a Secret, which uh, there is a death, but, you know, that's not the, the uh, core of the story. Um, it's not a, a murder investigation as much as trying to figure out who is it that, again, is, is trying to harm the reputations of the, of the characters. And that's a, that's a really good point because sometimes the, um, a lot of times I should say in these stories, the initial crime that's being investigated is not murder, but there's the threat of death physical death, if you don't figure out what's going on. There's that fear that, um, for instance, in kidnapping, that's an obvious fear. You know, if we don't find this person, they could die. Um, or the um, searching for the person selling state secrets, you know, the world might end. So the, in, the end point could be physical death. And so that's sort of what's trying to be pre prevented in the investigation. And I think that that makes it really fun because you are, you're worrying along with the sleuth if they're going to get it in time. Yeah. And uh, another example, again, just uh, thinking about secrets and like you mentioned, state secrets, John Le Carre's Agent Running in the Field, which I highly recommend listening to the audiobook because he actually narrates it, um, which was really, really nice to listen to. Uh, you know, there's there's no murder in that, but it's a, a question of who's who's telling secrets and and do they realize they're telling secrets and and uh, who are they telling them to? The who can you trust is a really big feeling that I get when I read these types of mysteries because the the sleuth or protagonist is always on shaky ground, not really knowing who they can trust when they're trying to unravel. The, the case. And I think that that's true in a murder investigation as well. But these sometimes feel a little less black and white to me. You know, the, the steps of the investigation aren't quite as spelled out. And so I feel like we have a little bit more of that, the gray area and who can I trust and how am I going to, how am I going to get the information that I need? Uh, a great example of that is uh, Laura Dave's The Last Thing He Told Me, which mm -hmm. is uh, a domestic thriller that there's no, uh, you know, I don't think that there's any murder in that. It's it's a disappearance and they're trying to figure out, you know, 
why did the character disappear? And, and again, who, who can they trust as they try to try to figure that out? Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Another one that I thought of, and I don't know if I would characterize this as a mystery, although I did see it on a couple of, of lists of like underrated mysteries, and it was The Circle by Dave Eggers, which is, I think it would fall into the category of workplace suspense. And it's as much a commentary on social media and privacy as it is on that, you know, the, the tension that that comes out of that book around um yeah just things happening in the workplace that are that are unexpected that's neat that sounds like a, a bit of a crossover uh a crossover title that would be worth checking out yeah i read it i read it a while ago but i think it might be worth rereading as our focus on social media has kind of um ha- has changed since it came out i think it came out in 20 20- 14, I think. And you just think about how much has changed in the last almost 10 years since then. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, um, you know, young, you know, mysteries for young readers. So, uh, you know, I, I think most of the Nancy Drew and Hardy boys stories would be, um, uh, you know, they don't, they don't have murders. They've got a lot of the, the kidnappings and the, um, the secrets, missing objects, that kind of thing. Um, and they were certainly very satisfying to read as um, when I was much younger. Um, and I do have uh, a box set of the first 10 Hardy Boys books that I'm planning to um, start reading at, at some point soon. Um, and, and I'm hoping that they'll be just as, just as satisfying as they were um, they were then. And actually I've listened to a couple of the more modern versions of both Nancy Drew and um, Hardy Boys. And they were, yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, those. So I, I think um, to answer your, your first question, definitely these books can be, can be satisfying. In mentioning the mysteries for younger people, it brought back, we, we discussed this earlier when we were in YA mystery, uh, but um, you think about Scooby Doo, and those episodes are essentially the exact same story every episode, right? It's it's basically the same story with the details changed. But I will sit down and watch one every time. So yes, we can still find satisfaction in a very nonviolent uh, caper sort of mystery. Um, because this and the stakes, I would say in that one are, you know, they're scared to death and maybe they, maybe it is the fear of, of, uh, of death when that monster catches me, what's going to happen, but it just hooks you right in and you want to find out who the, who the disguised monster is. So, you know, they pull it off and I will watch one to this day. That's a great example. I was thinking about some of the authors that we think of as writing, you know, murder mystery. So Agatha Christie comes to mind. And I know she wrote some of her short stories were, uh, were not murder mysteries, but, um, you know, uh, solving theft. You know, the example that I can think of is um, the Christmas pudding or the, I think it's the theft of the Royal Ruby where a jewel goes missing and Poirot comes to the rescue and, and figures out what's happened to it. And yeah, it was, you know, a, a a great read. Uh, and I'm sure there are some uh, Sherlock stories that are not murders. Don't know if I can think of any offhand, but I'm sure that there are some where he's investigating a theft. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, our friend Sherry Mitchell suggested Agatha's The Last Seance, which is a short story collection that are essentially paranormal mysteries. Um, and I, I, bo- I shouldn't say that none of them contain murder because it's been a while since I've read the collection, but they're fantastic. And they're much more of that um, kind of eerie, paranormal, what's going on mystery. And they're they're fantastic. So you're right. Some of the greats also dabbled in this, um, even though I think at the core, the golden age audience really did love the body drop. No, that's a that's a great example. Of the I I had, don't think I've read any of the stories from that collection, um, but 
you know, it's coming up on uh, spooky season. So maybe I will be uh, reading one or two of those in, in a, a dark October night coming up. Yeah, they're great. And they're really short. So they would be a great before, um, you know, before bedtime read for the spooky season. So Brooke, would you consider Jane Eyre to be a mystery? That is a really great question. And I lean towards yes. And I feel the same way about Wuthering Heights. I feel like that's a bit of a mystery too. And maybe we're back into that uh, sort of domestic thriller subcategory that we that we covered before, but a, a really early beginning version of those stories where they have a lot of the mystery elements, even though it's not a pure mystery um, investigation. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think I would I would agree with you. I, I think I would categorize it as um, falling under the mystery space, an early example of yeah domestic thriller. Uh, because what is it that keeps you reading that story? It's trying to figure out what's going on, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're dark. You know, they've got a dark undercurrent. So um, yeah, I love those stories for that reason, much more than the romance that's that's involved. So one other series, and it's been a very long time since I've read any of the books in it, but um, I think certainly in the first book, There's No Murder, is the number one ladies detective agency by Alexander McCall Smith. Uh, I don't know if you've read any, any of those books, but um, I think they are more around being a detective rather than a, than a, 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 a sleuth solving mystery, uh, murders rather. I haven't read those, but that series did come up on a list of recommendations if you were looking for an, a mystery without murder. And um, we'll post that in our show notes because I, I came, I found a great list because that's the other thing I think. There is a... Um, group of people who love to read mystery that really don't want to read about murder. And so it's good to have some options if you would rather enjoy the the ride of the solving the puzzle, but don't really want it to get violent or gruesome. So we'll include that list. And um, I also would recommend for people who feel that way that they in that they lean towards the middle grade or YA mysteries because those stories are fantastic. And even though the sleuths might be a little younger, I think you still get the same experience of mystery and you're, you're going to get a lot uh, less violence and um, less deep or dark topics. So I would point people in that direction. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, you know, I think we talked about that um, when we were talking about YA, that it can be kind of a, a lighter take on some of the heavier, um, heavier crimes. Mm -hmm. So Brooke, thanks for this conversation. I think it was really good to uh, explore some of these uh, non-murder mysteries. It was really fun. And I'm going to pay closer attention and kind of start tracking the stories I read that fall into this category. So everyone, thank you for joining us once again on Clued in Mystery. I'm Brooke. And I'm Sarah. And we both love mystery.